Hello, my name is Olive. Uh, I'm the developer for Crescent Loom. And today we're going to be talking about how we have started using it in classes to teach uh, basic neurobiology. Hi, I'm Eric Zornick, a professor at Reed College. And I'm Liz Leininger. I'm a professor at New College of Florida. Many of the things that you can investigate using Crescent Loom, like network connectivity, um, looking at the effects of synaptic strength on the output of a circuit, are things that you, you want your students to learn in neurobiology and neurophysiology courses, um, but those are really difficult to explore rigorously in an experimental setup in the lab. And again, many of the techniques that you want your students to learn uh, about how science, neuroscientists go about studying neural circuits um, are challenging. This gives you the opportunity to hand students a big old neurophysiology toolkit and say, um, solve a problem, use that to solve a pretty complicated problem and really get a, a, a real sense of the the value of each of those techniques, the, the advantages and the limitations of each technique to realize that you really do need that full toolkit. So um, Erica and my courses in the spring had some shared features which allowed us to collaborate on materials that would work for both of us. So both of us were teaching undergraduates in introductory courses, um, which we'll explain a little bit more about later. So we weren't assuming much prerequisite knowledge of neural circuits and behavior. We were both interested in implementing some teamwork-based learning, and we both really wanted to emphasize experimental logic in the lessons and we were both teaching our courses online because of the pandemic. So despite some differences in the way our classes were organized and some slight differences in student population, Eric and I had similar goals with what we wanted to teach using Crescent Loom, namely what are central pattern generators and why are they important? How do both excitation and inhibition play a role in how CPGs operate? And um, how can we use experimental logic to figure out the connectivity of, the, of a CPG? And so those were sort of the core things that we wanted our students to leave um, the course with having interacted with Crescent Loom. We'll be talking about a few different creatures that are available in Crescent Loom for use in lessons. The first creature, Peacock, is a good starting creature, which we used to teach students about how CPGs are configured and how to dissect one using the tools available. The second set of creatures are the Bendy creatures. Bendy 1, Bendy 3, and Bendy 5 can help illustrate how species differences in connectivity can relate to species differences in behavior. To prep our students for these activities, we developed some materials, some of which are posted on the Crescent Loom website. Thank you, Olive. Uh, these include some YouTube videos about Crescent Loom and about CPGs in general, uh, lab handouts as well. Um, and we, I uh, made a quiz for students to complete after viewing those preparatory materials. That's not posted on the website, but is available upon request. Now we'll talk a little bit about the characteristics of each of our courses, um, because that can help you understand why we designed the activities in the way that we did. I teach at New College of Florida, which is a small public liberal arts college. I was teaching an introduction to neuroscience course, which has no prerequisites whatsoever and is open to both students interested in majoring as well as students who are not interested in majoring and maybe are only there for their science requirement. Uh, I taught my students online via Discord. We did Crescent Loom over a few class periods of 50 minutes each, as well as some asynchronous assignments. I will quickly explain the sequence of events here. Before coming to class for the week, my students prepare by reading, watching videos, and taking a quiz, and this week was no exception. They watched some videos that I developed about CPGs and about Crescent Loom, and they took a quiz over this material. In our first class meeting, we used the peacock creature. We started by me driving Peacock and demonstrating how to operate Crescent Loom briefly, starting with the behavior and assessing what was happening with the motor neurons. Then students joined small groups to begin work on an assigned interneuron. 
this work continued into Wednesday. They were assigned a specific interneuron and then asked to identify all the connections between that interneuron and other neurons, as well as assess whether that interneuron was a pacemaker or not. That took the whole class period. Then on Friday, we had about 15 minutes to debrief on the results and to see the full connectome. I used a program called Miro for students to be able to work together online. Each group of students had a table for them to organize the work they were doing, and each student in each group was given a role um, to help them contribute to the group. I was able to leave comments on their work using the speech bubbles. And we were also able to build a circuit diagram of the CPG as we were confirming connections. So while most of my class time was devoted to the peacock activity, my students solved an activity related to the bendy creatures as a summative individual assignment. This uh, was in lieu of giving course exams. And so on their own, my students were able to explore how different connectivities supported species differences in behavior. And so I teach an introductory to biology course called Topics in Biology. Um, also, this course has no prerequisites. It's largely first year you know, um, college students um, open to both majors and non-majors. The course is fairly large. There's a lecture component. This was fully online. Um, I had about 70 students in the class and there were four lab sections each week um, for up to four hours every afternoon, Tuesday through Friday, um, because we were doing some in-person labs. Um, every other week we would have in-person labs. Um, we had less, fewer than 18 students divided into two different rooms with myself and one other instructor. Um, and so I was developing the Crescent Loom activities to um, provide us with activities for our online weeks. Um, in fact, we used this at the very, in the very last two weeks of the semester when quite honestly, students were pretty burned out and exhausted from a really hard um, year of school during the pandemic. It was geared toward being fun and um, fairly low stakes and non-intensive. Before the first lab, I had the students watch the videos that Liz, Olive and I prepared ahead of time and they also took a pre-lab quiz and read a handout. At the beginning of each lab section, uh, we worked together as a group where I drove the Connectome Explorer and students suggested experiments so that we could uh, work on some of the neurons uh, in Peacock. And this took about 20 to 30 minutes, after which students broke out into their small groups in breakout rooms and each small group was assigned one interneuron and asked to determine its projections as well as to determine whether that neuron was a pacemaker. After that was finished, students came back to the main room and one spokesperson from each group told me their results, how they came about them. Um, and I, as they described those, I sketched those out. At the end of that week, each student was then assigned one of the bendy organisms and asked before coming to lab in the second week to solve the connectome for that bendy. So the following week, each student was asked to come to lab prepared with their assigned bendy connectome completed and to have done some observations of their bendy's behavior. I then did a demo race between um, the three bendies um, and then the students went into their groups, similar to what we'll be doing this afternoon where students were paired with students that had studied other bendies so that they could share their notes and discuss the differences they saw. They were asked to observe the behaviors again and try to relate the differences in behavior to the differences in their connectomes. So I decided to use a Google Slides file to keep track of all of the experiments. Each interneuron um, was color coded. So in this case, uh, BOP, um, the slides associated with BOP are green. There was an initial slide as shown here where students are able to sketch out 
uh, the connections either with red lines or blue lines showing excitatory or inhibitory projections. So as students were in their breakout rooms, I could go to the various slides for each room and see how they were progressing. If it looked like they were coming up with some connections that weren't quite right, I could stop by their breakout room and check in with them. Um, each group then had other multi multiple slides for keeping a record of their experiments. And each slide was associated with a single connection or projection. So this is an example of a slide um, where students tested whether BOP projects to now. Um, and so they were able to design multiple experiments, take some screenshots and, and show the results, uh, show the show the data and then describe the results and, and come up with a conclusion. So in this case, the students found that BOP sends an excitatory projection to now. So I've been teaching neuro, neurophysiology, upper level neurophysiology lab for several years now, both using uh, crawdad, uh, crayfish electrophysiology, as well as um, uh, my own study system, Xenopus frog vocal behaviors, looking at muscle activity in the, the vocal organ, as well as brain doing brain recordings. And what I've found is that the, those hands-on experiences are, they're, they're fantastic for <laughs> inspiring students who, who catch the neurophysiology bug and they realize that they want to keep doing this. It, it's Many students, Olive was probably the first, but have described neurophysiology to me as a video game. It's like a game, right? You get your, you get your neuron, you record it, it's fun, um, but it's also incredibly frustrating. And many students I think are turned off by neurophysiology. And so what I love about Crescent Loom is that it's this low barrier simulation that everyone can use no one has to be frustrated by constantly breaking their electro tips um, by having to fight noise, uh, electrical noise, um, all of, and, and not to say that those aren't important for becoming a neurophysiologist, but I think I want all of my students to understand the concepts of neurophysiology. And many of them don't get that from the sort of frustrating real life hands-on experiences um, in the lab. And so this, I think, is a really excellent way to make sure that all students um, really master the, the concepts and understand the value of neurophysiological tools. And I think also for courses uh, like mine, my introductory neuroscience course that doesn't have a lab component to it, it's a really great way to bring in lab style thinking, experimental thinking in a way that's really accessible, in a way that can be sort of edited down to a 50 minute period or a few 50 minute periods. You can, you know, make really small assignments. You can make larger ones. Um, you could do this as a completely asynchronous activity if you wanted to. Um, and so again, yeah, for my students, some of whom might continue in neuroscience, but others who others may not, I think it is compelling for all of them, uh, which is something that I would want to bring into an introductory course. Yeah, like I have brought this to Minecraft conventions and seen students as like young as 12 or like 10 um, pick up and make functioning central pattern generators um, and get like excited about doing it. Um, yeah, so like even though this has a lot of the like deeper simulations, I've tried to like make the barrier of entry as low as humanly possible um, in order to pick up as many people and get that neuroscience bug um, into as many brains as possible.